Hello, good morning. Nice to see you all up there. This is in a funny place, this. I'm just going to move it. Hope I don't fall off. Right. Got plenty of wipes if anyone needs one. That's just in case. Right. <clears throat> um, can anyone see that I don't have a box of sweets in my hand this morning? Sorry about that. I apologize for that. Uh, it does give me a chance, uh, again, to be up here to just say thank you to those uh, who bought me pictures uh, last time uh, of what they'd been doing as notes when I preached last time. I've got them uh, on my desk at home in my little home office, and uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for those. So thank you for those that did that. Um, right, this morning we're going to be continuing our series in John. Um, you'll remember that John tells us himself why he wrote it. In chapter 20 and verse 31, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So hopefully this morning as we look at chapter 9, uh, we can expect to see more evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and, uh, 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 and we can, you know, we can ask ourselves the question, uh, I can ask you the question, have you believed that yet? I mean, is that, is that true for you? Have you believed that? Uh, have yours, your eyes been opened yet? Uh, maybe they will be even today. Uh, and we'll consider some things that this incident reveals to us about having life in his name as we believe in him. Uh, last week, Rich was uh, helping us to see that, uh, that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but we'll have the light of life, how Jesus brings the light uh, and how that deals with the darkness. I'm going to start by reading the first part of uh, chapter 9. As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. We hear it again there. He is the light of the world. After saying this, he spat on the ground. He made some mud with saliva. He put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, nah, he just looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked. I don't know, he said. So Jesus heals physically. The, the center of this part of the story is straightforward in that respect. And Jesus opened the eyes of many a blind person while he was here on earth, uh, and he healed many other diseases as well. This wasn't a one-off exception. We could go to Mark 8 and the blind man at Bethsaida. Jesus healed him in two stages. And I can already hear those of you that are learning the sequence of Mark, ready for the Mark drama, saying, and then Peter confesses Christ, isn't it? Some of you will get that. And there was spitting on that occasion as well, but I'm not going to try and explain that. I'm going to move on to Bartimaeus uh, in Mark 10, where we can uh, hear, hear of another healing of blindness that Jesus did. In that case, uh, there wasn't any spitting or any mud uh, or any bathing. There was a man crying out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And, uh, and a response uh, well, Jesus asked him, what do you want? And he says, I want to see. Jesus says, your faith has made you well. So we're not looking at a formula, but we are looking at a pattern of Jesus healing. 
In Luke 7, we can also see when John the Baptist sent his disciples to find out a bit more about Jesus. Uh, they, they went to Jesus and, John, and they said, John the Baptist sent us to, ask, to, to you to ask, are you the one, the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? And at that very time, this is what goes, goes on to say next, from, that, from the point of that question, it then says, at that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So we're seeing ample evidence of Jesus' authority in these healings. And this has continued through history. There are many a book telling personal testimonies, and you may have your own. I always remember at New Day, enjoying the usually Thursday night, I think it was, uh, when there would be a time of praying for people to be healed. There would be testimonies from the previous year of people that had been healed. Uh, and, 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 and people would have a chance to uh, testify in the moment, to go and check uh, with, a, with a doctor even, um, or, or go home afterwards and carry on uh, and, and hear testimonies of how, how they've been healed and, and how it's validated. Uh, and then the next year, you'd hear them coming up saying, last year, I was healed. This happens. This is happening. Jesus has authority over sickness. We could also take notes that there's this moment where the man has to go. We saw this when looking at the, the royal official who came to ask Jesus to heal his son. And as he goes, at the point he goes, the man is healed. There's this action, this putting into action uh, the, 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 the response of the person that, that seems to play a part. But we can't look at this just as a healing without considering for a moment the, the kind of discourse around it, uh, the questions that it starts with, the disciples ask, who sinned, this man or his parents? I find it a little bit of an uncomfortable question. Uh, John doesn't include uh, in, his, in his selection of miracles. He, he's just, John just includes some of the miracles Jesus did. Um, we, we know from other Gospels that there was an occasion where Jesus had a, a paralyzed man brought to him, and everyone's expecting him to be healed. But Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. So perhaps, I don't know, perhaps the disciples have in mind at this moment that they're thinking, I know, we're one step ahead of Jesus this time. He's not going to heal him. He's going to forgive him of his sins. Perhaps they're thinking the problem of sin is a much bigger issue than the problem of blindness. And maybe they'd be right. Perhaps they have, and perhaps we sometimes have, a lot of questions about healing. It can mess with our heads a bit, can't it? We can be thinking about it a lot and trying to work it all out. And, uh, and we too maybe can want to establish a clear cause of the problem uh, so that we can pray the right prayer, so that we can guarantee the healing, so that no one gets hurt, so that we know who to blame if they don't get healed. Probably their own fault. They've probably sinned. This answer from Jesus just brings us a whole bunch of comfort and, uh, uh, and it takes a whole load of pressure off, doesn't it? Um, it turns their eyes from looking at the person and the, and the illness and he turns their eyes towards God. His answer, neither, is just a great another way of saying, you're asking the wrong question. Your question kind of implies that you've worked out what all the options are and you've decided you just want me to agree with one of your options. But God doesn't work like that with us very often at all, does he? He, 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 he comes and he says, well, to be honest, I'm not limited to what you perceive are the options. My resources are infinite. My grace is sufficient. There's a greater answer that, frankly, makes your question redundant. So for me, this helps me when I sometimes am tempted to overthink about healing. I can go back to verse 4 and 5 here. 
And Jesus' answer, where he says, I am the light of the world. And in this case, it's an opportunity for you to see a display of God's glory. It's not even about the person or the sickness. This is about God and him displaying his glory. It just takes the pressure off us, doesn't it? He draws people into what he's doing. The blind man doesn't, himself doesn't turn up and come to Jesus with uh, a list of demands or a list of qualif- disqualifications or with a sense of entitlement. Well, you know, I think I've suffered long enough to be, you know, it's only fair, really. Uh, or it's not fair that I had this in the first place. Or it's only fair that you hear me now. He doesn't come with that kind of attitude. He's just, in fact, he doesn't really come at all. He's just there. Jesus comes to him. Touches him. Sends him. The man does what Jesus says. And from that point, his life is transformed. What well, Just a marvellous display of God's glory and his grace. And Jesus is still the light of the world. He still displays his glory in many ways. He still heals today. Some attempted to think that God never heals. Some attempted to think that God always heals. We can believe, we must believe, that we come to a God who still heals in this in-between time in which we live. When he does it, it's a display of his glory. Even recently amongst us, we've had testimonies of people who have said, been praying for ages maybe, for, 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 for a bad shoulder, and then in worship one morning, able to lift it as they praise God and receive that healing. Um, I, I think later on, I'm going to be inviting us to pray for each other for healing. Um, and there'll be an opportunity to, for you to decide if you're in the camp that's going to risk praying for someone to be healed this morning. There'll be an opportunity for you to risk being healed today. But before we get to that, right at the start of this encounter, Jesus is already signposting beyond the miracle itself. The disciples, I think, were perhaps onto something. He's pointing beyond the physical healing he was about to do to a greater work. So we need to read on. So from from verse 13, let me read it for you. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man said, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, here's a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They said. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it now he can see? Well, we know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can now see or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He said, I've already told you that you're not listening. Why, do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. 
To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when, that, and when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. True story. When I was in year five, I started learning to play the piano. And I used to go to piano lessons on a Wednesday night at Miss Thistleton's house. She was my piano teacher. She lived with her sister. I don't think they went out much. I think they enjoyed the company. Um, used to be 50p a lesson. Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, I used to have, uh, me and my sister used to walk around to her house, and I'd have to sit there and listen to my sister's lesson. And then, and then I would get my turn to uh, perform. And if she could tell that I'd practiced more than once that week, which, which happens sometimes, um, if I'd been doing my practice, uh, she would give me the 50p back and said, buy yourself some sweets on the way home. I, I, my piano isn't great, but it was good fun. Um, she had this lovely piano, uh, all, all, all she was a piano teacher, so of course she had a lovely piano. Uh, at home, our piano was a, a hand-me-down, and it was a little bit ropey in parts, if I'm honest. But uh, uh, we, uh, <laughs> it got to the point where it, it, it was decided that it wasn't just my playing that was the problem, it did actually need tuning. And so my dad arranged for a piano tuner to come round. Um, piano tuner uh, was called Dave, and uh, Dave arrived, uh, and he arrived with his dog, and he came into the house, and I was quite excited because I'd never seen a piano uh, being tuned before. I didn't know what was going to happen, and uh, I like dogs. And so the, the, the dog came in, and, and he sat the dog down, uh, took the harness off, and he got out his tool bag, uh, and he started taking the piano apart, and took the big front off it, and took it apart, and got his tools out, um, and he's twisting things, and tapping, and noise is coming out, and I'm can't tell the difference, but it's all very interesting. Uh, and you probably worked out by now that, that, he, that, that he was blind. But he had exceptionally good hearing, which is why I believe he was a piano tuner. And um, after about an hour of this, he, he says to my dad, uh, can I just borrow your toilet? Oh, your toilet, I need a toilet. So my dad, ever, ever wanting to be helpful, says, uh, yes, yes, let me, let me show you to the door. There's the door handle, puts his hand on the door handle. There's the door handle. He says, when you get in there, it's under the stairs. Just be careful, it's a low ceiling. Uh, uh, the toilet's just on the left. The sink will be in front of you. And the light switch is just a pull switch on the right. My dad, uh, he, says, he says very graciously and with great humor, he says, uh, thanks, but I'm not be needing that. My dad was, was mortified, if I'm honest, he was very embarrassed, uh, but, but the guy was so gracious that we were, we were able to laugh with him. Um, my point is, why have I told you this story? What's my point? <laughs> I can't even remember. No, 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 it's It's because we talked last week about a light, Jesus being like, what's the point in a light if you're blind? What's the point in there being light if you're blind? So this chapter, this next section, is building up to verse 39, where Jesus says, For judgment I have come into the world, so that the blind will see. Jesus is talking here about our spiritual sight, about realizing that we are sinners. We are spiritually blind. That's where we start. That we will face judgment we do need a saviour and that Jesus himself is that Messiah, the Son of God, that saviour. We need our eyes opening to see this truth. And Jesus is the one who opens our eyes. 
Just as we looked at a few examples of Jesus' open, physically blind eyes, I want to help us just quick look, quickly look at a few examples in other ways in which God has opened eyes. Firstly, I'm going to take you back to uh, our series in Abraham and the time uh, when Hagar and Ishmael were in the desert about to die, thinking that they had no water left and, and had no resources. And it says that Hagar's eyes were opened to see a well. Obviously, she wasn't blind. The well was there, she was there, but she hadn't been able to see it. In Numbers 22, we could look at Balaam, who was making a bit of a mess of the situation. You can read it all later. I'm just quite, quite a light touch on these. But uh, he's making a bit of a mess, mess of a situation to the extent that his donkey had to have a word with him. Um, who doesn't love a talking donkey, eh? In the morning, we're making waffles. Eventually, okay, eventually, the Lord opened Balaam's eyes so he could see the angel blocking his way. Or we could go to the kings and we could uh, remember that time where Elisha's servant comes to report that they are surrounded by an army with horses and chariots. And Elisha says, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elijah needed to pray. He prayed, open his eyes, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of chariots and horses of fire. I see your chariots and horses and I raise them, chariots and horses of fire. What a moment for him as his eyes are opened. In these examples, people don't realise at the start that they're not seeing the whole picture. They're initially blinded from seeing the full facts, the full reality. They don't realize that help is at hand. Life-sustaining water is within reach. An angel is keeping you from making a mistake. A greater heavenly army surrounds a now paltry-looking earthly army. As their eyes are opened, their perspective changes. What if that's us? What if situations in our life, we think we've seen all the salient facts and we're despairing? We think we've got all the pieces of the jigsaw, but in fact, we haven't. What hope there is in admitting we only see in part, if at all, and asking God to open our eyes to greater realities. And perhaps there's some danger in thinking that we have seen it all, that we do know it all. We do think we've reached our decision based on the full facts. And really what's happened is we've just yet to have our eyes fully opened. Let's put ourselves in the man's shoes, the blind man's shoes, uh, that's just been healed from the point of being healing. Up to this point, he's never met Jesus before. This is the first time he's met him. Um, maybe many of you will be able to remember back to when that was true for you, that before you met him, and that you remember that time when you did meet him. For some of you, it might be true that you still haven't met him. Let's look at this investigation by the Pharisees. Uh, he gets asked a lot of questions, and so he gets the chance to make some responses. In verse 11, he says, the man, he refers to Jesus, he says, the man they call Jesus. It's kind of a recognition in there that he's a man, he's got a name, he knows that other people called him by that name, so I've heard of him, heard of him. You might, that might be you. I've heard of him, I've heard of Jesus. He goes on, uh, and in verse 17, when they ask him uh, another time, he says, he is a prophet. So there's this kind of recognition that he's more than just an ordinary man. He's a, he's a special man in some way. He's a prophet. Uh, scooting ahead to verse 30, he says, he opened my eyes. So within that, there's a confession that here's someone that can work miracles, um, possibly even more than a prophet. And by th verse 33, he's boldly stating that Jesus, he is from God. This kind of journey that he's on of faith, this growing recognition of who Jesus is, um, 
he's got to the point where he recognizes he's from God. That's our journey, isn't it? We go on this journey and we, 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 we begin to understand uh, not only the facts about Jesus, but about what he did and who he did and what that means for us. Uh, he's the answer to the problem of our sin. He is the judge of the world. But all this could be for nothing. It could be for nothing unless he crosses the line of faith. Without verse 38, the, spirit, the man's spiritual eyes would remain closed, would remain shut, would remain blind. But joyfully, thankfully, finally, in verse 38, we see this climax of his journey where he says, Lord, I believe. And he demonstrated that belief by worshipping Jesus. No one, nothing else is worthy of our worship. No sports team, no book series, no imaginary character, no film, no hobby, no Olympian, no comfort, no person. In calling him Lord and giving him worship, we count all else as worthless. We let go of all trust in wealth or our plans or our own wisdom. This is what having our spiritual eyes open looks like. We can now see clearly. And perhaps most of us today share this part of the story already. We realize that we were spiritually blind, unable to see the way. But Jesus gave us the eyes of faith, and now we do see. I was thinking, if only someone, if only someone could write a great hymn that included that line. I was blind, but now I see. Wouldn't that be great? Anyone writing songs, Mark, add that to your album. I don't know. If you can come up with some other words. So the British curling team have done well, haven't they? The men winning the silver yesterday. Women winning the gold today. I hope no one recorded that. Uh, anyway, possible spoiler there. Um, obviously, if they lost, I'd be saying... The Scottish curling teams have lost, but, uh, uh, but fortunately they won, so we, we could all be British today. Um, has anyone else got into the curling this week? It's, uh, it's, uh, I, I must confess, I've got a little bit drawn in. It's, it's quite fun when you start watching it, uh, bowling on ice. Um, now, it's not just sliding all the stones down, all 16 stones down, and then seeing which one is nearest the centre of the house. New knowledge that, just sharing that. Uh, Centre of the house. Um, as the stones go down, there's a lot of bumping into each other. And uh, when the stones bump into each other, there's a bit of movement of other stones. There's some knock-on effects. Sometimes it will be a carefully guided one down that just nudges one a little bit closer to the centre of the house. Other times they slam them down and they all get torpedoed everywhere. So I'm not going to overdo this analogy, I promise. I, this, this next point really is that, that, that when Jesus opens our eyes, it not only affects us, but it affects others as well. So apart from the reaction of the healed man, we're going to look at the reaction of the investigating Pharisees and the parental witnesses that get called. And I don't think there's any secret that these are examples generally of how not to respond, um, in case you were wondering. Uh, so maybe the question for us then is, how can I avoid falling into the traps that perhaps they fell into? I'm going to start with the parents. I used to think that this was just a great biblical example of Parenting adult children, uh, knowing when to no longer speak up on behalf of our children. If we ever went out for a meal, uh, when our, our girls were growing up, I, I would allow, uh, or some might say insist on, my daughters telling the, the waiter or waitress what they wanted to eat. Uh, I, would, I would be thinking, they are of age, 
They may speak for themselves. I'm not sure I ever actually quoted that to a, a waiter or waitress, but I think it might have been in my head. Um, but actually, this, this, uh, this, this, this example here it, it is not an example of good parenting of adult children. It is that the parents are afraid. So the Pharisees have made up this rule that says anyone who says Jesus is Messiah are going to become social outcasts. We're going to chuck them out of the synagogue. So the parents are kind of trapped, and uh, 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 and, and they they just they're just afraid. Now, parents here, parents in the room, I know some of you might be here with the target of just hearing and remembering one thing this morning. Um, perhaps this is the one bit you'll remember. Uh, you're also going to remember that resilience you displayed today as you gently helped your little ones take another small, tiny, possibly step in learning those two immensely important life skills of sitting and listening. Maybe it was just a small step this morning. Maybe it was a step backwards. But anyway, as well as that, as well as that, parents can note that the God of heaven opened the physical and the spiritual eyes of the Son. We don't seem to read that the parents had any part of that. Now, I know parents, you do a great job, but the parents saw their son healed of congenital blindness. They saw his eyes being opened and them discovering God. It was Jesus that opened their eyes. So, these parents that we see here just, just respond in fear. Uh, they're just worried about what's going to happen to them. They're, they're parents of fear. I, I, I want to encourage you to be parents of faith, not parents of fear. I want to pray that you'd pray for yourselves not to become more skilled or to discover better behavior management techniques, also known as better snacks. But, but, but perhaps... My pray, that you would pray for yourself that you would remember, that you remember that God loves your children more than you do. Okay? God loves your children more than you do. So come along, Sunday by Sunday. Live every day, day by day. Come along every Sunday, year by year. Don't worry if one week... Your cherub is a little restless. We're family. It's not a problem. We are never thinking, oh, I wish that child hadn't turned up this morning. No, we never think that. We thank God every time a baby or a toddler comes in through those doors into the presence of a worshipping people. Don't stay away. Don't give in to fear. Don't apologise and don't give up. Jesus said it couldn't have been more clear, could he? Let the little children come. Come and worship. Come and bring your children. Children, you are so welcome here. I genuinely miss, I genuinely miss being able to stand in worship and hold one of my girls in one hand and raise one hand in worship before the Lord. I genuinely miss that. Right, the Pharisees, moving on. Yeah, yeah, those days are definitely behind me. <laughs> for those, uh... Sorry, Jade. Um, it's hard to know to start, where to start with some, some of the Pharisees. Uh, let's remember, some of the Pharisees are genuinely trying to understand what's going on. But as I mentioned earlier, they've made up this rule that anyone believes in Jesus, they're getting thrown out. And so they're, they've backed themselves right into a corner, haven't they? They're literally... If, they, if they're going to look at the evidence uh, and agree with what's happening, they're going to have to you know, throw themselves out of their own synagogue. You know. and how's that going to work? So their first attempt is to make a big deal out of it being a technical transgression of the Sabbath law. I mean, Jesus kind of has uh, started this fight, hasn't he? He, 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 could, he, had, he had six other days to choose from, but no, he, he went for the Sabbath again, I think, as a, 
as Blessing puts it, uh, oops. This legalistic thinking just revealed again in them. And, uh, and, and Jesus, of course, is uh, Lord of the Sabbath, and he shows it again. Um, they are wobbling a bit, though, aren't they? They, they keep asking some of the same questions, uh, sometimes positively searching, but some, sometimes maybe some of their questions show they're just trying to catch him out or find a, a loophole. Uh, yeah, they ask, how did he open your eyes? Which, which effectively contains an admission that they do think uh, he's, that, that Jesus opened the eyes, that, that he did do that healing, that, that he does have that authority. But really, they just slide into a, a, a deeper and deeper pit with it, really, don't they? Uh, they're, uh, but they, they go on to some personal insults. You know, they, they say, this man, when they're, they're referring to Jesus. They, they stop even using his name. Let's just call him this man. Let's just degrade him a little bit. Uh, I guess if they used the word Jesus, they'd be saying deliverer, rescuer. Probably a bit awkward to be saying deliverer and rescuer and then denying that that's what he is. So they go for this man. Then they get a bit angry. Always a good sign that you're losing an argument, isn't it? Get angry. I, I, I mean, I just love this bit about where the man's kind of winding them up a little bit there, isn't he? Uh, I, I, in my mind, I just go to all these different ways of uh, imagining the tone of the question, do you want to become his disciples too? You know, was it a, would you like to become one of his disciples too? Or was it a, uh, do you want to become one of his disciples too? <laughs> or even a, you want to become his disciple too? Na 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 na. I, I don't know. Maybe that's just in my head that uh, I imagine the, these different ways of. Uh, um, but uh, whatever it is, it's a tragic opportunity missed, isn't it, by the by the Pharisees? They're so hung up on their rules, they they've missed the central message of, of not just the gospel but the law. They've missed the, they've missed the whole central message of the law. Jesus' acts of healing, it's, it's about loving God and loving people. Uh, and their response does neither. They fail at both in trying to do both. Again, it makes me think for myself, and maybe it might help you to think, uh, to pause and consider whether we're at risk of being led by the enemy into such traps ourselves. Are we so convinced we're right about something, even something based on scripture, that we've in fact missed a greater mandate? Are we now so intent on winning some tiny argument, on taking some speck of sawdust out of a brother or sister's eye, that we've forgotten to check for the planks in our own eye? Are we so caught up in our dissatisfaction with something, some situation, that we think it's okay to speak without love for God and love for his people, for our brothers and sisters? or indeed for anyone he created. Let's keep checking in with ourselves, people. Let's check in and make sure we're aligned with Jesus, gentle and lowly. Let's not align ourselves with the Pharisees who are legalistic and argumentative and angry and insulting. I'm going to land with this. <clears throat> So we are sent to bump into others. Going back to verse 4, key verse in here, where it says, Jesus says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. We're invited to join Jesus in doing the Father's work. What is that work? Uh, many places we could go for a definition, but I, I'm, I'm going to use Acts 26 and verse 17. And the words of Paul, as he recounts what Jesus said to him. I am sending you to them to open their eyes. I think you can see why I've chosen this one. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness for sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. We're heading towards Easter. 
where we're going to be remembering all the events. But that will include a moment where Jesus himself subjected himself to blindness. You can read it in Luke 22. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. He suffered this on our behalf, and in exchange, he opens our eyes. This is indeed good news to share. So as we hear God pointing us ever more outward, as we have another go at street reach, and we do the Mark drama, and we celebrate Easter Sunday, and whatever else we're going to do uh, as, we, uh, as we go to people or as we bring them in, Let's hear that call to go courageously, to be ready to go to the world, to use whatever version of ours, whatever our version is, of saying, one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Responsibility for judgment remains firmly in God's hands. He is the one who opens and closes eyes. So maybe there'll be moments where we're sad, but not shocked when some reject him and us. When we get fearful and angry responses like we saw in the parents and the Pharisees. But let's not be too surprised when eye after eye after eye is opened and voices come and join us in declaring, I was blind. But now I see and respond like the man did. I, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Jesus, I worship you.